looking at some of the muscles this week, naming them, numbering them, um, and thinking a little bit about the blood vessels and the nerves. But um, the main thing really is to really have quite good um, knowledge of the bones and the bony points. <laughs> So this lecture is going to be about clothing those bones and talking about um, putting um, the relations of the bones in place because none of the, um, the bones themselves live in isolation and when we have an injury to a bone then that can also have some impact and create an injury um, to some of the soft tissues and those soft tissues can actually be um, more important, you know, more damaging. Damage to those soft tissues can be more damaging, more important than the damage to the bone itself. Um, and of course, a radiographer who's dealing with a patient um, who's got a fracture can sometimes, if they're not careful, they can make the problem worse by moving the fracture fragments. Yep. Um, so it's something you have to be really careful of. So these are the three main nerves that we need to be thinking about um, coming out of the pelvis. So these nerves come out of something called the lumbar sacral plexus. Okay, so the lumbar sacral plexus sits within the pelvis. It itself is made up of nerve roots that come out of the spinal cord, um, that come out of the neural canal which we'll come on to when we talk about the spine. So um, the plexus is a sort of network of nerves um, and then out of the plexus you get these three major nerves, okay? Um, you get the femoral nerve coming anteriorly um, and that comes um, between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis. So that comes in that space there and comes anteriorly and that feeds the motor section of that nerve will feed the quadriceps, which are the muscles we looked at last week on the anterior thigh. And then we have a nerve that comes through the um, obturator um, of the, uh, the pelvis, um, and so the nerve is named after, or the, whichever comes first, the obturator nerve comes through. And that is more medial, and it feeds the adductors, the medial nerves of the thigh. Um, sorry, medial muscles of the thigh, the adductors, the groin, the groin muscles. And then posteriorly we have the greater, we have the sciatic nerve, okay, so the sciatic nerve runs down the posterior aspect of the thigh, and comes out of the pelvis at the point which is called the great sciatic notch, the greater sciatic notch. Sciatic nerve is actually two nerves all the way down its length. Um, and it branches eventually into those two nerves just above the knee and those, knee, those nerves are either the common perineal and the tibial nerve. That can also be known as the, the fibular nerve, the common fibular nerve. So, not too difficult to remember. There are other nerves of course, this one's the gluteal nerve, but we're just looking at the three main ones, the femoral, the obturator and the sciatic. Blood vessels, so the blood vessels for the lower limb start with the aorta in the abdomen. Um, the aorta is the main blood vessel in the body um, and that's fed directly from the heart, from the left ventricle of the heart. And we have lots and lots of branches of the aorta, but the aorta finally terminates at um, what's called the bifurcation and it terminates into um, the left and right common iliacs and then the iliacs they split into internal and external iliacs and the external iliacs carry on outside the pelvis again between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis alongside that femoral nerve so that femoral nerve we saw in the other picture you can't see it on this picture but it's running alongside this blood vessel here called the external iliac and as soon as it leaves the pelvis it changes its name 
It's one of those demarcations that we talked about, political demarcations, where there's no difference to it. It just leaves the pelvis and becomes called something else. You know, its waste bins are collected by a different council. Uh, it becomes the femoral artery, the, the superficial femoral artery, the SFA. We love our three-letter acronyms in, in anatomy, so that will almost always be called in the trade the SFA, the superficial femoral artery. Superficial actually sounds like it's the less, the less important, but it's actually the most important. So you have the superficial femoral artery, but it's the most important one. You can see there's a little branch there, and that branch is to the deep femoral artery, which is the less important one, which actually stops quite soon and just feeds the muscles and the, um, the, the thigh itself. It's also known as the profunda. Yep. So the superficial femoral will continue down, and it actually goes um, posterior. So it actually goes from the anterior of the, um, the thigh and it weaves its way round and actually ends up posterior to the knee. And once it's posterior to the knee, it makes another, another change of name, looks exactly the same, but it changes its name. Its weavy bins are collected by yet another council to tire that joke out completely and it becomes the popliteal artery. Okay, so the popliteal artery is the one that's in the back of the knee and then we get the popliteal artery stops at the what's called the trifurcation um, bifurcation is where something splits in two a trifurcation is where things split into three and at the trifurcation you have the anterior tibial posterior tibial and the fibular arteries and after that it starts to get not important Okay, this is an MRI. This is a, um, a, a magnetic resonance angiogram um, that we're looking at here. Um, so the patient will have uh, been in the, uh, the sort of magnetic tunnel and various radio frequency cycles will have been pulsed at the, uh, at the patient. Um, and their protons in the middle of their atoms will have been... Um, affected by the magnets and the radio frequency pulses and an aerial a big aerial will actually be able to pick up the signals as they process as they vibrate in line with the type of um, atom they are and the type of chemical bond they're in and the type of atom and the type of chemical bond allows us to identify what tissues they're in and we can either use a contrast media called gadolinium which has got, it's, it's, it's not gadolinium, it's got the element gadolinium in it, um, to inject, and then we can see the blood vessels. So this is actually a gadolinium enhanced MRI. So what we're doing here is we're displacing the blood with this contrast media. Um, but another way of doing it is something called time of flight, where we just look at where the blood, the magnetized blood has been. So we allow the magnetized blood to flow away and we can see the holes that it leaves. So that's called time of flight imaging. So you can do either or. So that's how we get these nice pictures. It's not the only way you can look at blood vessels. We'll come on to that in a bit. Okay, so that was just a quick whistle stop tour of blood vessels and nerves, the main ones that we, we care about. Um, if we go back um, to the skin and then we just remove the skin and the fat then we end up with these fascia, okay? And the fascia is um, like a stocking that holds all the muscles together. Um, and although it seems fairly trivial, it's actually a really important structure because without the fascia, we couldn't um, return blood to the heart from the lower limb because it's the, uh, the contraction of the muscles um, is held by the fascia, by the stocking, and so consequently any structure inside the, inside the limb um, will be squeezed a little bit when the muscles contract. So the veins are inside um, the, 
the deep veins, sorry, are inside the fascia, are inside the, the muscles. Um, and so consequently, when we want to return blood that's been pushed by the arteries down into the feet, into the calf, then all we have to do is squeeze our legs a little bit. So if you just stand up on your tiptoes or whatever, then that action is going to squeeze the veins and the veins will have one-way return valves in them. So that means that basically the blood gets squeezed, gets pushed up a little bit, it can't return because the valves open and stop it. And so by keeping moving, then the blood gradually gets back up to the heart, which is why um, people who have to stand, like policemen who have to stand at doorways and stop people coming in, they have to um, constantly sort of like keep moving a bit, otherwise their blood will track into their ankles and they'll pass out. So the, the ligament that attaches from the anterior superior iliac spine to the symphysis pubis is called the inguinal ligament, and it marks the boundary of the pelvis and the thigh, and that's the ligament that um, marks the boundary between the um, iliac, external iliac, and the femoral artery, naming-wise. Muscles that you can see. Obviously, we've got the quadriceps, um, on the anterior aspect of the thigh and they act in um, attaching to the patella through the quadriceps tendon or the patella tendon and then the patella attaches to the tibia through the patella ligament because it's bone to bone so it's called a ligament. Then we have sartorius. Sartorius is an interesting muscle in that it goes from the anterior superior leg spine to the medial aspect of the femur. Um, so it runs the opposite way, if you like, so it goes from lateral to medial, when most other things are going either straight down or from medial to lateral. Um, and that's called sartorius. Um, the idea is that in Latin, sartorius, it means tailoring. You know, you've heard of someone say sartorial elegance, perhaps, meaning that they're cl very well clothed, their clothes are very, very well designed. Somebody is um, well tailored. Um, and I suppose if you looked it up, then there might be some reference to the work that a tailor used to do, sitting on the ground, you know, in, in Rome. Um, they may well have had to um, sort of like stretch this muscle out when they were sitting on the ground lying down, um, sort of like working on clothes. I don't know. Look it up. I'm sure someone will have a, um, an explanation for why it's called that. Okay, the fascia of the thigh is called fascia lata. It's one continuous fascia over the whole limb, but the fascia in the thigh is called the fascia lata. Um, the crural fascia in the leg. And crural is um, a term which you will find referring to the leg quite often. So if you hear anything crural, then you're talking about the bit between the knee and the ankle. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about, these are all connective tissues, okay? We've talked about tendons, we've talked about ligaments, we've talked about fascia, and now we've got another word, a retinacula. A retinacula, and this is another band of fibrous tissue. In this case, we've got an extensor retinacula that runs over the, um, the ankle joint, um, we actually have a flexor retinacula in the wrist, just there. Um, so retinacula is a term that refers to this similar fibres of fibrous tissue. Um, so the, the retinacula is there because um, all of the tendons that run from the thigh into the foot have to turn around a corner, don't they? So they have to sort of go down here and then they have to go around the corner yeah, and so when I raise my toes up like that, I'm using muscles in my um, leg, and they have to purchase on something, and so the flexor retinacula um, keeps them taut at the, at the angle so that I can actually raise my toes up here. So the pull goes underneath the, flexor ret the extensor retinacula, like so. so. That's what that does. If we cross-section the thigh at this point, then we get this sort of real... Um, chunk of meat at the butchers. Um, 
This is the pro this is one of the prime cuts that you'd get in the butchers if you were going to butcher somebody. Um, leg of human instead of leg of lamb. So the femurs here as a long bone, the quadriceps muscles here, the hamstrings here, and these blue dots and yellow dots and red dots are blood vessels and nerves. And similarly, if we cross-section, then we get um, a bit of a lesser cut of meat, I suspect. So here we have the, um, the tibia and the fibula. The thing to notice is how much more anterior the tibia is to the fibula in midsection. When we start doing um, images of the knee, then this is going to become important. There's a little membrane talking about all these um, fibrous tissues, the fascia, the retinacular, the tendons and the ligaments. We've got another name for you. There's a fibrous band that holds the tibia to the fibula. You can see it there. Um, and that's called an aponeurosis. An aponeurosis. So lots of new words, but they all are fibrous tissue. Another feature that um, we need to sort of like mention is this tensor fascia latte, which is a muscle which attaches to the fascia um, and pulls on the fascia. And so muscles don't always attach to bone, as we talked about. You can't smile unless they are attached to your, to your skin to allow you to smile and frown. The tensor fascia latte is a um, muscle group that attaches to the um, fascia latte. And we have this fibrous band called the iliotibial tract, which is like a very long, it's like a tendon. Yeah, it attached to the glute and it actually comes down and attaches to the tibia at the other end. And so this is like a long, flat tendon, if you like, the iliotibial tract that allows for movement of the limb away from the body. What's that called? Abduction, thank you. So this is the muscle that will be, well, this is the muscle that will be involved in abduction, and this is the fibrous band that transfers the force to the tibia. So cross-sectioning this thigh again, we've got these compartments. <coughs> so within the one stocking of fascia, we also have compartments. So the muscles have sort of sub-fascia. And whenever you buy meat at the butcher's, chicken for example, you'll notice that there's that thin film that sort of like is over the muscle mass. And so there's these films of um, tissue that separate these compartments out. So you have anterior, posterior and medial compartments in the thigh. They're important um, to something called compartment syndrome, which we're going to talk about a little bit later at the end of the talk. This is a dissection of a cadaver. So what we can see here is um, the glutes um, and the hamstrings um, peeled back so that we can see that sciatic nerve. There's the sciatic nerve coming out here and the gluteal nerve. So um, if you've ever had an injection, an intramuscular injection, then what they look for is an area of, you can have injections subcutaneous, you can have injections into the veins and you can have this sort of midway point which is you can have an injection in muscle muscle being quite vascular so it's a bit quicker than putting it under the skin but it's not as quick as getting the drug in by using a vein yeah and then there's another way of doing it which is into the bone you can have injections into the bone remember we said that the bones were very very full of blood they were reservoirs of blood so if you can't so a quicker way than the muscle if you can't get drugs into the veins of somebody the quicker way to do that would be to go into bone. So paramedics can actually stick a needle into your shin bone yeah, and actually inject drugs in there. 
um, if they can't find a vein, an intraosseous injection. And it is as painful as it sounds, I think. But if you're in need of one, then it probably is the least of your worries, the pain. Um, so one of the muscle groups that they tend to use if they're going to do an intramuscular injection is the glutes, the gluteus muscle. Um, so it's quite important they don't inject it into a nerve. So it's important that they don't go down here in the sort of mass of the muscle of the glutes. That's the safe area for injection. So naming the muscles. So um, what's number four? It's not a muscle. Patella, yeah. What's number five? It's on the tibia, yeah. It's the tibial what? Sorry? Head. Not the head. Tibia doesn't have a head as far as I can remember. It's a bit smaller than a trochanter. It's a bit smaller than any trochanter, either the greater or the lesser. What do you call something that's a bony novel that's a bit smaller than a trochanter? Tuberosity, thank you, a tuberosity. So this is the tibial tuberosity, it's the attaching place for the patella ligament. That's the patella, so the patella ligament goes between those two. Um, so let's think about these, so um, number, number two, three and six, what are they? What muscle group are they? The quads, yes. So they're the quads, hamstrings on the other side, on the posterior aspect, these are anterior. Um, number one is this muscle that's attached to the anterior superior iliac spine and goes to the medial tibia. What's that called? Sartorius. And that just leaves number seven, which are the adductors. Okay, so femoral vein nerve and artery so they run on the midline so this is the medial aspect here of the thigh oh i forgot to say the convention when we get a cross section like this the convention is to look up from the feet okay so the reason i know that's the medial aspect is because we're looking if we chop somebody's leg like this like i've just done there then the idea is you turn it and look up from the feet yeah so you should always look at, whenever you see a medical image that's in cross-section, you can always assume you're looking up from the feet, unless someone's labelled it differently. So that therefore, if this is the midline, this is the medial, this is the lateral, so when we turn it up like that, that's the medial, that's the lateral, that's anterior, and that's posterior. Yep. So the sciatic nerve is posterior, femoral nerve is medial. Okay, so we have these veins that don't lie within the fascia, and these are called superficial veins, and they're the ones that people use to inject um, in your... So if you're injecting um, in your forearm, then you'll be using a superficial vein. Um, in the back of your hand, the superficial veins. So the great saphenous vein is a superficial vein on the midline of the thigh. Um, but the, the ones that really do the majority of the work are the deep veins, the ones that are inside the fascia, because they're the ones that can pump blood by using this muscle um, contraction and the fact you've got this stocking it, fascia, keeping everything tight together. So the, 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 the big veins you see on the outside that you can actually see under the skin, they're not really that important. In fact, we can remove the great saphenous vein we harvest it, not me personally, but the medics harvest that vein, um, several centimetres of it, they tear it out, um, and then they reverse it and they put it in the heart to allow for a conduit to um, bypass any blockages in the coronary arteries. They have to make sure they've turned it round, otherwise the vein um, valves will stop the blood going um, the way they want it. 
Okay, posterior muscles, we've got the hamstrings, which are made up of the biceps on the lateral aspect and semi, the semis on the medial aspect. And key areas that you need to learn for your anatomy exam, um, one of them is the femoral triangle, okay? So the femoral triangle is made up um, of the base of the triangle, which is from the um, inguinal ligament between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis. And then we have the adductor muscles by um, the medial aspect and sartorius, the lateral aspect. So we create a triangle. Inside that triangle, we have the contents, which we've already mentioned, which is the femoral um, nerve, the um, femoral artery, the superficial femoral artery, and the femoral vein, deep femoral vein. Well, it's not called the deep femoral vein, it's called the femoral vein, it is deep. Okay, so there are the key areas. Now we use these in radiology to gain access to the heart. I know it seems a long way away, but if they're big enough, they're about five, six millimeters across, um, and so we can actually put a needle into the groin in this area um, and actually feed a guide wire and a catheter from here all the way up through the um, external iliac, the common iliac, the aorta, round into the heart and we can either close off a hole in the heart. If you put a guide wire into the vein and a guide wire into the heart then they can go into the right side and the left side of the heart and you can actually work between the two and actually block up a hole. Um, and they do that in tiny little wee babies, congenital abnormalities in preterm infants that have just been born at 28 weeks or 32 weeks and weigh about a kilo. And they'll be doing that sort of work on them. It's fairly amazing. But it's through the femoral triangle that we'll be doing that. We also do that in adults as well um, to look at the coronary arteries um, and to put valves in, to, to put filters into the interior vena cava really lots and lots of treatments that we use these as access points to the rest of the body. So that's why it's an important area to learn. And from medial to lateral, lateral it's <coughs> vein, artery, nerve, yeah, which spells camper. Vein, artery, nerve. Medial to lateral. The floor of the femoral triangle is made up of muscles. Um, don't really need to know the names of them. I'm trying to go to the next slide. There you go. And then below that, if we go cut the muscles away, below the um, muscles of the femoral triangle, we've got the obturator nerve coming in there. So going from anterior to posterior, we have um, the femoral nerves and veins and arteries then we've got muscles and then we've got the obturator nerve we like to ask questions about what is superficial and what is deep or what is anterior and what is posterior to various other structures so learning things that way as well as medial lateral is useful another nice picture of this just pointing out one structures that structures that we haven't talked about, which is the lymph nodes. There's a, a load of lymph nodes in the femoral triangle. Um, lymph is collected from the tissues. Um, we haven't got time really to talk about what it is and what it does, but it's collected from the tissues and it collects and is filtered through nodes. And there are collections of lymph nodes in various parts of the body and there are some in the femoral region and that's that little green monstrous thing there that's a lymph node. Um, this is the um, core muscles that come from the attachments in the um, spine um, that allow for extension of the hip, um, psoas muscles and the psoas, iliopsoas muscles. So they're all attached to the lumbar spine. We'll come on to them in more detail. But when you're doing your Pilates and your core exercises, it's these muscles that you'll be uh, working. Hip joint itself, we've sort of done this. It's a, it's a synovial ball and socket. 
it has a bony cup called the acetabulum and a head of femur which sits in that cup. What we haven't mentioned before is this thing called the acetabular labrum. So this is like um, a rubber extension, if you like, on the outer edge of the... Um, it's made of cartilage, not rubber. Um, it's an extension that sort of deepens the cup and holds the femur really tightly into that um, joint. So I think we've sort of covered that. We've talked about the ligament of the head of the femur, which has a blood vessel in it. The important point is that it has a blood vessel in it. It's not actually that strong, um, so it doesn't really give an awful lot of strength to the joint, but it does provide nutrition to the head of femur through the blood vessel. So just naming a couple of the sort of um, ligaments. I wouldn't worry too much about the names of the ligaments. The inguinal ligament's the key one. Um, this is just to hammer home that point that we have the three main nerves that we need to know the exit of the pelvis into the limb um, quite clearly. If one has a dislocated hip, um, then the head of femur normally travels posteriorly in dislocation and it pushes against that sciatic nerve. So you see how the head of the femur is now pushed where the sciatic nerve should be? And if that's left for any length of time, the sciatic nerve can <coughs> call, be, suffer quite significant damage. And what happens is that the patient will forever after have lack of function in the, in the um, distal nerve roots. And here we have a scenario where the patient has lack of function in the distal nerve roots and they can't extend their foot anymore. It's called foot drop. So you get people walking like this because they can't actually lift their toes. So they'll just walk like that forever. A very famous actor called John Thor who used to play Morse in some of the detective series Morse um, that comes before Endeavour probably don't know but you can watch him on YouTube if you Google Morse and um, John Thor you can watch him walk on set he had this problem um, he didn't have a dislocated hip he had problems with his back which caused the same problem um, sciatic nerve palsy and so he has foot drop and you can see his distinctive gait um, he wasn't acting that that was him for real But we've talked a bit about the knee joint in practicals and in the seminars. It's a modified synovial hinge. Why is it modified? Do you remember what we said? What's a hinge joint allow? One way movement. One way movement. Uh, uniaxial, yeah? It's uniaxial, which means that it only allows movement in one plane. Yeah? And in the in the knees case, which plane is that? Sagittal, sagittal yeah. And so what are the two movements called in the sagittal plane? Flexion, Flexion and extension. Good, good. It's all coming to you. So this normally, a hinge, would only allow flexion and extension. What's different about the knee? It allows a little bit of rotation. When? When it's extended? No. When it's flexed, yeah. So if you flex it at 90 degrees, then you can get a little bit of internal and external rotation. That's why they call it a modified hinge. <laughs> okay. Underneath the um, quadriceps tendon, we have a, what's called a bursa. Okay, so it's another new concept for you. So you've heard of muscles, you've heard of tendons, you've heard of ligaments. I've given you loads of other names. We've talked about fascia. We've talked about um, aponeuroses. Um, so this time, this is a bursa. A bursa is, an, is a bag of synovial fluid. I don't know if any of you, were, when you were kids, did you ever have those slinkies? Little plastic bags of fluid. Do you remember them? You used to squeeze them and they used to fire out of your hand. Yeah, really good fun, yeah, little things. 
Well, think of a bursa as one of those, but in the human body. The idea is that it's there to allow things to move and glide freely over one another. Um, and you have one here under the quadriceps tendon, because every time you move your knee like this, and how many times do you do that a day? Think about your steps on your Fitbit. Yeah, I don't get to 10,000 steps, which is my goal. I usually arrange about 6,000. Um, but think about that. So that's 6,000 of those a day. And so what we need is something to free that movement up and allow that movement to happen and glide and slide. We don't want to be rubbing one muscle against another because that will get hot and will get friction. Yeah, well, it's not the bones in this case. It's the muscles rubbing one over the other or the tendons moving over another tendon. So they're all encased um, in little sacs called bursa. We have a few points of bursa. So there's a, there's a pre-patella bursa, which is just on the top of your... So it's between your skin and your patella. So we'll do this in the seminar, but have you ever thought it's really weird how much movement there is of skin over the top of your patella? And that's because there's a little sack of fluid underneath the skin, between the skin and the bone. It's called the pre-patella bursa. And if I was to come along with a hammer and whack it, then it will, little blood vessels will break and they will bleed into the pre-patella bursa and you'll end up with a big egg-like sack on the top of your knee, yeah, full of blood and it'll be red and it'll be sore and it'll be hot. So I won't do it. But that's called pre... And uh, you can also get... You can get an infection in that called pre-patella bursitis. And bursitis is, a, is an infection of a bursa. It's called housemaid's knee if you get infection of the pre-patella bursa. Um, because housemaids, of course, spent a lot of time kneeling down, scrubbing the bottom, scrubbing the steps. Or clergyman's knee. Clergyman's knee is another title because clergyman is another word for vicar or um, reverend. And so they spend a lot of time on their knees praying. So if you spend a lot of time on your knees, these days it's probably carpet fitter's knee. Yeah, carpet fitters who spend a lot of time on their, um, on their knees. So the patella is there to allow for these very large forces to be applied to the tibia. Um, and it allows the tendon not to wear out when it's rubbed across the knee because you have a, um, an articular surface between the patella and the femur um, which allows sliding and gliding movement. So it's a synovial, which type of joint allows just sliding and gliding? Plane joint, synovial plane joint, yeah. So the synovial plane joint that runs between the patella and the femur, the patellofemoral joint, you can see how that works. There's our pre patella bursa there, just a little bag of fluid just sat there. When we cut our knee across, we get, um, there's the super, super, um, supra patella bursa, which is an extension of the knee joint itself, which is full of synovial fluid. Um, and we have these fat pads. This one's called Hoffer's fat pad, H-O-F-F-A, Hoffer's fat pad. These become important in radiological imaging, which we'll talk about in a bit. I think I've got it in a few slides. And like we had that acetabular labrum around the acetabular to deepen the, to deepen the socket to hold the bones together, we also have these little menisci. There's another word for you to conjure with. Gosh, we've got a lot of new words today, haven't we? So this is a meniscus, okay? Um, and you have a medial and a lateral meniscus. And that sits on top of the tibia, and it makes the tibia, because you've noticed the tibial surface is pretty flat. It doesn't look like there's much of a cup for the knee to fit in. Well, these create the cup for the knee joint, for the femur to fit in. Um, they're round. We've got them in cross-section here, but they're round. or semi They're called semi-lunar, actually. So they don't quite make it all the way round. They just make it around the outsides, like C-sections, like a C-shape. And these are the famous cartilages that, um, that you can tear. You can tear your cartilage, can't you? And I, I told a group that I was doing some practical work with that I tore my cartilage um, 
while x-raying a patient in ITU at like three o'clock in the morning once because I wasn't thinking about myself I was thinking about all the machines beeping and buzzing and trying to get round the patient and I've planted my foot and twisted and felt the and then um, when I went to the doctor the next day um, they referred me to the acute knee clinic and I had to have my cartilage shaved which isn't very nice and it, they put an arthroscope through Hoffer's fat pad here and they go in and they shave a bit of uh, they shave a bit of the cartilage off this is an MRI scan so we can see the fat nice and yellow here and we can see the fluid nice and black and the cartilage also appears black so we can see a lot of this material on an MRI scan where we can't see it in x-ray when we look at x-ray this is what it looks like now there are four radiographic contrasts that we can see on x-rays there's the white of mineral in this case calcium um, and in this case it's um, probably some sort of metal powder up, um, so that's the white then we have light grey and the light grey is muscle blood and water okay muscle blood and water and then we have dark grey you see that dark grey there and here what structure sits here the fat pad the Hoffer's fat pad so you can see Hoffer's fat pad there dark grey against the light grey of the muscle of the muscle and blood and synovial fluid and then we have the black which is air okay so four radiographic contrasts so the pre patella bursa we can't see because it's blasted out here if we windowed it we might be able to see it but this is the supra patella bursa and you can see that the supra patella bursa should be here it shouldn't be up here it should be here so it's swollen that's the first thing to think about and then we've got this dead straight line here now straight lines aren't normal in the body so what that is that's a fluid level so this is blood pushing the fat up how do we get blood in the super patella bursa well the only real way is to break something that's very vascular and what's vascular what's got a lot of blood in it bones so although you can't see i would challenge you to look for a fracture here I can't see a fracture. I've looked at this image for a long time. There will be a fracture of a bone that we can't see in here, and the telltale sign is the blood in the joint. So that's what it would look like in diagrammatic form. And that's the reason we always x ray acute knees with the patient lying down. Yep. So it may be less convenient for us, but we move our x ray equipment around and leave the patient lying on a trolley to x ray their knee because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see that and therefore we'd be able to set, we wouldn't be able to spot a fracture. The very common cause of a fracture like that is called a bumper injury. Yeah, because the knee is just at a convenient height for the front bumper of any car. Yeah, so if you're crossing the road and a car comes and runs into you, it's going to whack into your knee and that's going to force um, it's called valgus deformity when the knee bends in the coronal plane so the tibia bends in the coronal plane out that's not an allowed movement is it so therefore consequently it's going to bang bones together in a way they're not meant to and potentially break them there's our menisci our cartilages and holding the knee together in the middle are the cruciate ligaments okay the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments referred to as the ACLs and the PCLs posterior part of the knee is another one of those sensitive areas do you remember we started our anatomy thinking about the difference between the anterior and posterior portions of the elbow and the anterior and posterior portions of the knee and we came to the conclusion that the anterior elbow was soft and squidgy and sensitive and the posterior elbow was bony and hard and the opposite was true of the knee the posterior portion of the knee was sensitive and soft and squidgy um, and that means that there is some vital um, vital organs vital blood vessels and nerves running here because the body 
is putting a lot of nerve endings on the skin to stop you from resting your posterior knee on sharp objects. Yeah. Um, so another area that's very, very common in exams is this area. It's called the popliteal fossa. And it's made up, the boundaries of the popliteal fossa are made up of the biceps laterally, supralaterally, um, the semi-tendinous semi and semi-membranous um, medially, and the medial and lateral heads of the gastronemus distally. So proximally you've got biceps femoris, semi-membranous, semi-tendinous, and distally you've got post the lateral and medial heads of gastronemus. Between them you've got the popliteal fossa. And the popliteal fossa has some veins, arteries and nerves in it. So handily they're called the popliteal artery, the popliteal vein, and we have the um, tibial nerve and the um, common perineal nerve. So it's artery, vein, nerve, nerve, medial to lateral. Artery, vein, nerve, nerve. You've also got these <coughs> lymph nodes. So it's another area where there's lymph nodes. I'm going to finish up now by talking about these compartments a little bit more. So in the crural section, so this is a cross section of a leg. Um, so here's our tibia, here's our fibula. We've got the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment. Don't, don't worry about the names of these. We don't need to name them. We just need to think about the compartments. There's this boundary between holding the fibula to the tibia. That's called the aponeurosis. So that causes the boundary of the anterior compartment. You see the anterior compartment's got these blood vessels in it. Posterior compartment's got some blood vessels and nerves in it as well. So here we have a patient, okay, um, this young boy, yeah, he was playing somewhere he shouldn't be probably, and a block of concrete fell on his leg, yeah, um, and um, his leg swelled up, and he tried to carry on. Obviously, he didn't want to own up to being in a place he shouldn't have been in. Um, so hobbled home, tried to carry on, um, quite a lot of pain, eventually goes to casualty, um, and no bones broken. However, do you remember what we call this, the popliteal artery comes down here and it does something, it calls, it's called a trifurcation, isn't it? Splits into three. Count. How many does it split into? So it comes down here, yeah? One, two, there's no third branch. That branch that should come off there isn't there. That's blocked, okay? So what's happened is that that is now bleeding into the tissues rather than running down into um, a blood vessel. And you've got a large hematoma building up pressure in that compartment. So that compartment is filling with blood, okay? Um, the compartment filling with blood means that pressure is being put on all the other structures. Pressure is being put on the nerves. So in casualty, what they do is they cut. Here's a big gash, look. They cut down the posterior part of the leg, and they take the hematoma out. It says that um, they evacuated a large hematoma. Yep. But it was a bit too late because the damage had been done and the pressure had actually killed the nerve. He was subsequently found to have extensive necrosis of the solus and flexor hallux longus. So his muscles had also wasted away. So he's got foot drop now and he'll always have foot drop. I had um, another patient who had had a very, they were a driving instructor and um, their, one of their pupils had stopped and stalled at a roundabout and so obviously somebody had run into the back of them, yeah. 
uh, because everybody looks, don't they, where they're going, think, well, there's a big gap, they'll obviously be driving off. And so they ran into the back of this person who was stalled at the roundabout. Um, it was less than a 20 mile an hour crash, just a jolt back. Came to casualty the next day, feeling unwell, feeling nauseous. I x-rayed their chest, um, that was what was requested. Um, and then we got a phone call a couple of hours later saying can we um, do an emergency angiogram. Um, so we set up the operating theatre, brought this patient back. Their left arm was weak and cold to the touch. And so what they did was we looked and we put contrast media into their tree, into their heart, and watched the heart pump it round effectively, and no blood was going into their left arm. And they dissected their subclavian artery. So the subclavian artery had been torn and blocked and that person actually had to have their arm amputated. <laughs>